Back in April of 2020, which feels like years ago at this point, we were supposed to be celebrating Golden Gate Park's sequicentennial anniversary. There was supposed to be music, food, celebrations, and the thing that I was most excited about, a big old Ferris wheel to commemorate the park's 150 years. But that never happened. I think we all know why. It was a little sad. I was looking forward to riding the observation wheel, but instead it just kind of sat there in its unfinished state, almost like it was taunting me. Taunting me because, as you may know, I kind of have a thing for amusement parks. Most kids during my time had a favorite movie that they would pop in and rewatch over and over and over. Me? I had this thing. This was the tape that I run ragged through my VCR, and that's because I just love learning about roller coasters, amusement parks, the whole science behind it, and the wonder of building these gigantic mechanical contraptions. 20-something years later, you know, time has moved on. I'm much older, at least on paper, and I should be interested in doing things like my taxes or being a responsible adult. But this is definitely something that has stuck with me throughout all of these years. You know, my passion for amusement parks and rides and roller coasters has only grown since the days of, you know, bootlegging Discovery Channel documentaries. And that's why when the Sky Star Wheel was announced, I got really, really excited. You know, this would have been the first thrill ride, or close to it, in San Francisco in almost 50 years. And no, Bushman doesn't count. Despite the city being labeled a playground for millennials, there's been a surprising lack of themed amusement over the past five decades. But now that we have a bona fide, actual, real ride here in Golden Gate Park nonetheless, I thought I'd give you guys a brief history of San Francisco amusement parks and some of the wildest rides that came with them. And when I say brief, I do mean brief. There were only ever actually two real theme parks in San Francisco city limits, Playland at the Beach and Woodward Gardens. We'll start there because Woodward Gardens is one of the oldest, possibly the wildest, and perhaps the most forgotten about park in San Francisco history. Woodward's Gardens, that's an apostrophe S, was built in 1866, not long after San Francisco officially became a city, and it was built in the heart of the Mission District, right around where the SF Armory sits today. Chances are you probably haven't heard of this place, and I don't blame you. Up until about 10 years ago, you'd be lucky to find a single photo documenting this place's existence. But now we have a clear vision of what Woodward's Gardens was really like, thanks in no small part to Marilyn Blysdale, a legendary historian who put together this book featuring over a hundred photos of the former amusement park. Woodward's Gardens was the brainchild of a Gold Rush era collector named Robert B. Woodward, and this was nothing like the city had ever seen before. Like we're talking crazy stuff for the late 1800s. Things like hot air balloon rides, merry-go-rounds, they had an ostrich farm there, and even Monarch, the grizzly bear that you see on the California state flag, even he was trapped or was living here for several years. Keep in mind this was the late 19th century when people cared more about the worldliness of their own city than the proper treatment of animals. But even with all the presumed abuse, this place lasted for almost 25 years until it was eventually torn down in 1891. Fast forward 120 something years later and really not too many people remember Woodward's Gardens at all. Everyone seems to remember the 1894 Midwinter Fair though, which was this worldwide exhibition of culture, science, and technology. So I guess everyone's kind of focused on that big thing. Or maybe they were just looking for more of a thrill. So that's where the shoots come in. If you've never heard of them, the shoot the shoots rides were the 1890s equivalent of the modern water flume ride. Basically, you just climb a tower, board a boat, ride down a ramp and splash into a giant body of water below. The city was first introduced to these rides in 1895, and thanks to a local attorney named Charles Ackerman, we had an entire amusement park right on Haight Street. Now it's true that modern audiences are probably looking for more of a thrill than just the 5 or 10 seconds you get splashing into the water, but when it opened, thousands upon thousands of people lined up just to get their first hit of adrenaline-induced bliss. 
The ride didn't stay there for long as it moved west a little bit to 11th and Fulton, but still retained most of the fun. Both parks had things like railroads, swings, shooting galleries, and of course, a zoo. Because no 19th century park is complete without also caging some animals. After the 1906 earthquake, there was a steady decline in visitors, and even though the park remained pretty much damage free, it ultimately closed three years later in 1909. The owner tried migrating the business again to Fillmore Street, and that worked out for a little bit until a fire brought that place down. You'd think that would spell the end for something like the Chutes rides, but not so fast. If we go a little bit further out west, we'll find an even bigger park that was about to take off. After the demise of Woodward Gardens and the fall of the Fulton Street Chutes, we had a new seaside amusement park open, Playland. Originally the area started out as kind of this haphazard collection of rides which included things like trolley cars, more shooting galleries, and their very own Shoot the Chutes ride which actually inspired the original name of the park itself, Chutes at the Beach. But after being open for a few decades, the space evolved into a complete amusement park thanks to the Whitney brothers George and Leo. From 1926 on, they brought in these new, bigger, better attractions to kind of fill out Playland's immense repertoire of properties. Things like bumper cars and fun houses, spinning rides, roller coasters, concession stands of all shapes and sizes. Basically, nothing was off the table for them. They even bought the neighboring Cliff House and Sutro Baths, turning the entire shoreline into their own little Playland, so to speak. And for the next five decades, Playland remained a beacon of entertainment for all of San Francisco until it finally closed in 1972. Thankfully though, many of the park's artifacts were preserved in one way or another. Laugh and Sal, the huge scary animatronic, was actually sold in an auction and found a new home over in Santa Cruz. Over in El Cerrito, there was a museum called Playland not at the beach, which collected all these relics from the park, including signs, ticket stubs, and parts of the original attractions themselves. So with all that being said, I think it's safe to say that Playland will probably go down in San Francisco history as one of the most successful attempts at bringing an amusement park to a city that by all means deserves one. I think what's most surprising to me is that Playland was essentially the last of its kind. Since its closure, the number of amusement parks that have opened in San Francisco sits at exactly zero. Invite you to win one of five vacations, a four-day, three-night trip for four to Marriott's Great America, Northern California's largest entertainment center. Now, I'm not saying that the Bay Area doesn't like to have fun. We have Santa Clara and Vallejo with their own amusement parks. And a little bit further south, we have the charming veggie-themed Gilroy Gardens, but you can't say that there's something unbelievably quaint about putting a roller coaster right next to the beach. Playland is gone, that's just a fact, but it still does live on in other places, such as the carousel. Built in 1906, the original Playland carousel is actually still in use today, and is actually one of four carousels in San Francisco. There's also a Herschel Spillman carousel in Children's Playground at Golden Gate Park, which features these gorgeous hand-carved chickens, camels, and cats in addition to the horses. There's one over in the San Francisco Zoo, which is special because it was originally built by the German carousel engineer Gustav Denzel in 1921, and is one of only a handful of carousels built by that company that has survived to this day. And of course we have Pier 39's lovely Double Decker Carousel, which features these gorgeous depictions of SF landmarks hand-painted on the side. So I suppose while we're talking about Pier 39, we can also talk about some of the rides there. Like, it's not a theme park in the traditional sense, but over the years, this spot famous for selling gaudy tourist sweatshirts has also been home to some actual rides. Aside from the carousel, there's a little drop tower, uh, a couple of 3D motion simulators, which have found four extra dimensions in our universe, uh, there's assorted trampoline doohickeys, some green screen photo sessions, and some other themed experiences meant specifically to embarrass dads, but that's kind of about it, and most of it seems just a bit insincere, I guess. If we want something more substantial, and definitely something more honest, then we have to go elsewhere.
Now the Skystar wheel is pretty tall, but we came this close to getting an even bigger record-breaking ride. Originally when the idea was pitched to build an observation wheel in the city, a plan for a 728 foot wheel was drafted. It was going to be called the Golden Gate Flyer, and it would have been the tallest in the entire world had it actually been built. The project would have also fleshed out an entire recreational site on Treasure Island with the money from ticket sales going towards things like affordable housing construction and would have included an IMAX theater, a motion simulator, and a technology exhibition hall among other things. Despite the good intentions, it never came to fruition, but had they actually done it, it would have brought San Francisco back into amusement park relevance, at least for a little bit, with one of the most ridiculous objects to jut out of the city's skyline. Instead, we got the Sky Star Wheel, which at 150 feet is no rinky-dink carnival ride. For all intents and purposes, this thing is big. 36 gondolas line the perimeter of the wheel, and at the very top, you get some incredible views of the city. Did I ever mention I was afraid of heights? Uh, let's move on to the next spot. Did you really think I was going to go through an entire video about amusement parks without mentioning Musée Mécanique? Come on. Musée Mécanique, the former Cliff House resident, now resides over in Pier 45, right past the fresh crab kiosks and close to about half a dozen other seafood markets. But fishy is the last thing I would call it. It's delightful, palatable, stimulating, soothing. It's my happy place. I could talk about it for days, how the little mechanical arcade has been around for decades, how the original owner collected these fragile little treasures, how his son continues to own the business and maintain the machines, and how every quarter spent there gives you an experience that is uniquely San Francisco. Simply put, you'd be a fool to think you'd find another place like it. Ed Zielinski, the original owner of the place, started his collection in 1933 with an old antique slot machine, and over the next seven decades, his collection ballooned to over 300 pieces of priceless mechanical nirvana. Yes, it is a stretch to call Musée Mécanique an amusement park, but there are enough motorized dioramas, spooky fortune tellers, and music players to carve out a niche all its own in the world of entertainment. And the one through line that connects all of this is that Ed Zielinski was friends with Playland owner George Whitney himself. The two would regularly trade pieces of their own collections, which included one of the world's only steam-powered motorcycles. When Playland closed, many of the antique machines ended up in Musée Mécanique. And from here on out, I think the only thing that we can hope for is that that cycle will continue, that we can keep the spirit of places like Playland and Musée Mécanique alive and well for any and all future amusement parks. So there you have it, from Woodward Gardens to Playland to the Sky Star Wheel right here, those are the best and most historic attractions and entertainment experiences that San Francisco has ever offered. But if you ask me, we're not done yet. constantly trying to repaint what entertainment in San Francisco looks like, but the coats of amusement parks past will always continue to peek through. You'd think a place with a history of being as young, fun-loving, and freewheeling as San Francisco would have all the reason to build a new amusement park, but in fact it's the opposite. Kids make up a very small portion of the city. Less than 13% of San Francisco is under 18, which places us dead last among all major US cities. That kind of makes sense, right? Fewer kids, in theory, would mean fewer reasons to have something like an amusement park. But, like I said before, San Francisco is a city for the youthful side that exists somewhere in all of us. The contents of our so-called millennial playground are always getting shuffled around depending on the latest trends, but San Francisco has no shortage of arcade bars, museum nightlife, and interactive experiences, so I have little doubt that people still desire at least a small amount of pleasure in their lives. 
I mean, I guess the stress of a never-ending career grind and looming economic implosion has something to do with it, but how can you not want a couple of fun photos next to a giant ice cream cone? After all, fun is fun, and I for one welcome our new Instagram-worthy overlords, because until I can convince Mark Benioff to build that Alcatraz roller coaster I've been dreaming of, things like the color factory, escape rooms, and the Sky Star wheel right here is a small step in the right direction. The sad truth is that people get older. They mature, and over time they can lose that youthful exuberance that causes them to appreciate the childlike wonder of things like amusement parks. It gets ground away and blunted into an ostensibly more responsible version of ourselves, but that's no way to live. To me, even something like a simple ferris wheel is a reminder that the city hasn't lost its desire to appeal to everyone's inner child. What it's really about is reeling back in that San Francisco that sought to impress, that sought to thrill, and sought to delight.